Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webcast on employment and independent living skills assessment. My name is Jim Martin, and I created this, this material we're going to look at today, and I'll be the narrator for this tour we're going to go on. So it's great to have you here. We have a lot to cover, but before we get started, allow me to tell you a bit about myself. I am Professor Emeritus from the University of Oklahoma, where I directed OU's Zero Center. I was a professor in the Department of Educational Psychology, where I taught in the special ed program, and I taught numerous transition courses, transition assessment courses, um, have done a lot of research in the field, have developed lesson packages, assessments, uh, delivered dozens of, of teacher training in services, both of, of nationally as well as internationally. And I'm glad to be able to be here to talk about this topic in, in a webcast. So without further ado, let's get started because we have a lot to go over today. So I need to uh, click a couple buttons to get going to share. So I'm sharing the PowerPoint folder right now. And now I'm going to make the file go into presentation mode. So many thanks to the Illinois Center for Transition and Work who's sponsoring this webcast and this entire webcast series. Uh, I am a graduate, by the way, of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign campus, and as an alumni, as an alumnus, which is the singular version of alumni, as an alumnus, it's great to be here uh, doing this project for the U of I. Um, I studied what today would be called secondary transition education when I was a student at the U of I and have been doing so since. And, it's great to see Illinois, the Illinois Center come into existence and uh, doing the fine work that they're doing. So let's move on with our presentation. The topic is employment and life skills assessment, and I'm Jim Martin. So today there's four major, four major topic areas we're going to touch on. A couple of them will be brief. The other two will be much more in depth. So briefly, we'll examine the purpose of special education. Second, we'll look at a few transition assessment fundamentals. In other words, things not to forget about transition assessment. Third, we will look at multiple domain assessments uh, with ample validity evidence, those that have uh, supporting psychometric properties that show that these are, are decent assessments to use. And we'll look at multi multiple domain assessments that have little to no validity evidence, but you may still find a use for them in a student's transition assessment battery. So let's go look at these. So the purpose of special education as written in IDEA 2004, the very first paragraph of IDEA 2004, by the way, it states purpose of special ed is to provide a free appropriate public education that emphasizes special education and related services to meet students' unique needs. And, and this part got added in, it wasn't always there. And, you ready for this? To prepare them, prepare students with IEPs for further education, employment, and independent living. So the role then of special educators, regardless of, where on the age spectrum they might fall, their students might fall, elementary, middle school, high school. The work we're doing uh, on behalf of students with IEPs should prepare them for further education, employment, and independent living. That's a pretty powerful addition. There's a couple transition assessment fundamentals that we have to keep in, in mind that IEPs must include post-secondary goals. And now you know why we do that, because uh, the purpose of IDEA specifically says we have to pre prepare students for life after high school in the area of employment, further education, and independent living as needed. 
and thus we have post-secondary goals in those three areas. And the regulations, especially indicator 13, advises us that we need to have annual transition goals to enable students to attain their post-secondary goals. The law also says that we have to, we have to use transition age appropriate assessments to help students, help the IEP team uh, facilitate these goals. And these assessments need to be related to further education, employment, and independent living when needed or when appropriate. The Council for Exceptional Children is the largest organization in the world uh, for comprised of uh, professional special educators. And it's a large division and it has many subcomponents, many divisions. And the Division on Career Development and Transition, DCDT, uh, is the one focused specifically on secondary transition education. And it's also my favorite of all the divisions. Uh, and a number of years ago, Pat Sitlington and her colleagues on behalf of the board of DCDT developed a, a policy statement for the board what DCDT thought transition assessment should be. Interestingly, most of what was most of what, what Sidlington and her colleagues included in this statement made it into the federal special education transition law. It's pretty cool. So our our transition law is based on best practice recommendations. So let's see what the DCDT people had to say. So transition assessment is the ongoing process of collecting data on individuals' needs, preferences, and interests as they relate to the demands of current and future working educational and living environments. And assessment data serves as the common thread to tie all of this together. The focus is on students as future workers and future citizens. Student choice is a major theme through the entire process. Transition assessment is ongoing, future focused, and person centered. What this means, the ongoing part is interesting. For some people, it might be once a year, because at least once a year we need to do transition assessments. For some students, it might be a couple times an academic year. For other students, it could be several times a month. It all depends on who the student happens to be and the needs they have. That's what make it, makes it so person-centered. And as much as possible, students need to direct their own transition planning process with coaching, of course, with assistance. And then the results of transition assessment, when all the results come in together, it makes a match between the person's strengths and needs and preferences and demands of the world that they live in and the world students hope to have. Transition assessment has been around long enough that federal courts have made some decisions about transition assessment. And for the most part, they've, they have, well, I'm, I'm gonna strike what I just said. They've withheld, they've uphold, excuse me, they've, they've upheld what the legislation says, and in a couple instances, they've actually nudged it a little further. Let me tell you what that means. So Prince et al. examined district court findings. These are court, these are cases, they were due process cases in the schools, and one or the other party wasn't satisfied with the results, so they appealed it, and then it goes eventually to federal district court, and the federal district courts issued decisions based on their view of the evidence. And Prince et al. found in examining these court findings this, that the courts believe, just like the law states, we need to use multiple assessments, plural, not just one. We just can't use one career interest assessment and be done. We have to use multiple assessments and we have to use multiple assessments across transition domains. 
at least one transition assessment, according to Prince et al's recommendations they drew from looking at these decisions, at least one transition assessment has to have ample supporting validity data and reliability data. In other words, the, the, the test uh, had to be made in accordance, it had to be a well-made assessment that has supporting psychometric properties designed for that particular group of students that is being used with. In a student transition assessment battery, we can use other assessments. These are assessments that have little to no supporting validity evidence, as long as we have at least one that has adequate supporting validity, validity data to support its use. The courts also believe, according to Prince et al's findings, that we have to maximize student participation in the transition planning process. This means to me, we also need to maximize it in the transition assessment process because that's part of the whole planning process as well, because that the assessment process feeds the results that we use to help make the transition plan. So consider this, idea 2004, idea 2004 states that an independent living goal needs to be addressed when appropriate, when appropriate. That's all it says. I think there's, there's two ways that I've seen schools look at this and individuals and educators within schools. Without evidence, the IEP team decides we don't even have to bother with independent living goals, independent living assessments. This is for the teacher down the hallway, not, not, for, not for our students. Or educators will use data to determine if it's appropriate or not, because all students are going to live somewhere when they're out of school. So let's see what that might be predicting into the future and what skills students have now to prepare for that future. Doesn't mean the special educators have to teach it, but we identify the strengths and needs and come up with the needs and then the IEP team, including the parents, can look at means that students can learn those particular skills that they will need in the future. Make sense? Sure makes a lot of sense to me. And I hope you consider that second point as what you do with your IEP team is that you decide to include or not include independent living goals because the data make that decision for you. So now let's go look at some of these assessments. I call these multiple domain assessments because they're, they're um, they're like going into a huge um, supermarket, into a huge grocery store. You have the meat department, the produce department, the home goods department, the canned goods department, the fresh milk department, the frozen food. You have all of these different categories in one store. And once upon a time, these used to be little individual stores. Now they've all combined together into one large grocery store, or even like the superstores that have all of those plus more in it. So those are multiple domain stores. Here we're going to look at assessments that include multiple domains that cover lots of areas. So let's look at a few of those. First one I wanna tell you about is Transition Planning Inventory 3. Gary Clark and Jim Patton are the authors of this. And this has been around for, boy, I don't know, probably 20 years. I'm just guessing, um, but uh, they've just recently released version three or edition three of the TPI. And it has many components to it. As you can see, uh, you can purchase it in different packages, but to get the whole package, it's about a little over $350. And that includes their administration guide, the uh, further assessment recommendation form, the school rating form, the home rating form, student rating form, student preferences, and interest form basic 
the student preferences and interest form advanced a summary of performance exit document, and then a modified form of their assessment information for students with other with significant support needs. And then home efforts preferences and interest form. So they've done a lot in, in one package. Um, and so it, it's quite an assessment. Um, but many educators use this across the country. Um, others uh, decide they would rather use other tools. They find others more appropriate for their students. But the thing is to look at it to see if this one is really for you or not. So the TPI domains, the transition planning inventory domains, look at employment knowledge and skills, functional communication, self-determination, living, personal money management, community involvement, leisure activities, health, interpersonal relationship. That's the major domain. And as you saw earlier, they include supplements like interest forms, student preference and interest, um, home preference and interest forms. So they have others as well. <clears throat> and as far as I know, these other components, uh, last time I looked, didn't have any supporting validity evidence, but the main assessment tool did. So these related products, um, there I would, uh, for what I know now, and I may be mistaken, but from what I've been able to find out, these are informal assessments, but the original assessment, the, 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 the main assessment tool that covers these domains does have ample validity evidence supporting it. So it's a, it's a comprehensive package of assessments. Uh, here's how you score. Like this is the independent living example. Uh, knows how to find a place to live when he or she lives, leaves home. One, two, three, four, five. Don't know or not applicable. Knows how to do routine household tasks. One, two, three, four, five, don't know. So they're broad items across a wide variety of, of domains. And this is one that, and uh, they have uh, an educator version, a student version, a parent version. Uh, and what, what I know, and I might be mistaken because I haven't seen all the most recent data with the TPI-3, but the, the only one that I believe has ample supporting validity evidence is the educator version of this. So that's the TPI-3. Transition Planning Inventory, third edition, the complete kit. If this intrigues you, you might be able to find one around your district someplace or, um, or just see if you can get an examination copy to look at if that's even possible. This other assessment I wanna tell you about is the Diagnostic Adaptive Behavior Scale or DABS. Uh, it's put out by the American Association of individuals with developmental disabilities, and it assesses the adaptive behavior of, of individuals between four and 21 years of age. It's norm referenced and it has, it's very well made. It has ample supporting validity evidence. Uh, and the information that is used to complete the tool comes from someone who knows the student very well. And it covers all areas of adaptive behavior, conceptual skills, such as number, money, time, social skills, practical skills, which mostly focus on activities of daily living, and occupational skills, healthcare, travel, um, safe use of phone, and so forth. It has a, a web-based scoring system that requires single-use codes and there's a packet of 10 scoring codes, cost 10 bucks. And the user's manual and 25 interview forms are 155 bucks. This is used a lot for determination of disability, uh, like in the, in the uh, initial determination of, of uh, having an intellectual disability. Many school psychologists will use the DAP to see if if uh, the diagnosis of, of a, if, um, intellectual disability actually exists. Uh, but 
when you use this, you can also pull from it many strengths and needs that can also go into the IEP. And it's a, it's a, it's a source that would have ample validity evidence and it covers all of the adaptive behavior domains. An interesting one, this is, is fairly new, is the support intensity scale C for children. It's the children's version, also produced by the American Association of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. The CIS S is what it's called. Um, and it's there, there's children and adult versions. This one is just, just for children. The adult version, you have to get a different version. It's norm referenced, ample supporting validity evidence. The children's version examines specific medical and behavior support needs. Uh, part two of it explores seven sections, home living, community and neighborhood, school participation, school learning, social activity, advocacy, healthcare and safety. And then the results are kind of cool because it yields information on the frequency and amount of support and type of support that, is, that someone would need, that a student would need to do various tasks in different environments. The cost is about 155 bucks. Uh, if you order a lot of them, it be, it's, you get a, um, a volume discount, I guess. But the SD, you know, many, um, well, I don't know if there's many states, but I know several states use the support intensity scale as a way to help determine uh, placement where, uh, how much support does someone need matches what kind of residential placement options that they're going to require. And in some states, they even, uh, from what I hear, is they uh, will, will base partially uh, the reimbursement back to the programs based on the results of the, of the, of the IS, of the CIS-C. So another one that's used a lot with diagnostic assessment is the Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scale. Once again, it's, it's, a, it's a norm referenced assessment, ample validity evidence that is used to determine if there's significant adaptive behavior failings or not. Uh, there's a Spanish version as well as an English version. Um, it's a survey interview with a parent and care, caregiver rating forms. It takes 20 to 60 minutes to complete. There's a longer version that can go up to an hour and a half. Teaching rating form takes about 20 minutes. Uh, the main domains are communication, daily living skills, socialization. There's optional domains you can look at too, such as a maladaptive behavior index. You can do an online or paper pencil. There's many options to purchase this, about $215 to $450. I haven't seen many teachers use this as an educational support tool. Um, I've seen it mostly used and heard that it's mostly used for diagnostic reasons and eligibility reasons. But if it happens to be the time when this is done, if you can get a hold of a copy of it, because it would be a good assessment to pull strengths and needs from that you could add into your assessment results for a student. Same way with the scales of independent behavior revised or SIBR. Um, it's much like the Vineland, but it's simpler, non as many items. Uh, the scales are community and personal living, social interaction, motor skills, overall measure of independence. It looks at uh, 14 adaptive behavior and eight problem behavior areas and its norm reference. Cost about 450, get up from Riverside Publishing. Once again, typically this is used as a part of the diagnostic process of, to determine eligibility for special ed. Uh, but if it happens to be the time when this is done, grab it and pull in information you can from it to help look at strengths and needs for students. So to finish this section up, we looked at the TIP3, which a lot of educators use, and when it's scored, it doesn't give you an overall score as such. 
but it, but it gives you a listing of what all your answers were. And you need to go through and pull out the skills that are, are where the student's doing fine, the areas where they need, they have needs. It's the only one of these that is like this. These others that we looked at, the, the DABs, the, the CIS, uh, the Vineland or the Sib R will give you an overall score. And if you want more specific teacher educator information, you have to go in and pull it out. So I would, you know, for most practical purposes, the one of these that works the best, I think from a teacher's perspective would be the TPI-3. These others, they're out there. They're very good assessments. I would grab a hold of them if you can use them. I mean, if they're already done, but I wouldn't go out of my way to administer them to get teaching information from. A lot of educators prefer many of these other assessments. They cover multiple domains, sometimes they're for a more unique population. Uh, unfortunately, most of them have little to no validity evidence. So inter transition assessment battery, you'd have to have at least one assessment with ample validity evidence. So one of these that teachers really do like is the informal assessments for transition planning. It's a little book that is included within the TPI-3, or you can purchase it as by itself from ProEd. Uh, there's, it's an ebook now. Uh, the items are reproducible. It covers employment, daily living, health, self-determination, leisure, community participation, community. Uh, you just flip through and find an assessment that you like. And um, they're, they're, they're generally teacher-made assessments that cover a broad variety of topics. And educators generally find one or two in there that they like to do. Like this one. Uh, here's a part of one, spending and saving money. This is what students would, would complete. Choose the response that best describes you. I never seem to have money. A lot, somewhat, not at all like me. I would rather save my money than spend it. I often brag about how much money I have and so forth. Um, there's a, uh, another set of assessments called the Enderly Severson assessments. And there's three versions of this that are available, of available paper pencil or online. Esther J is for students as they write in their literature for students with mild disabilities. The Esther three is for students with more disabilities. The Esther S is for students with severe multiple impairments. For uh, educators, uh, who work with students that have severe multiple impairments, they really like the Esther S because there's so few assessments that are uniquely available for this, for this population that the Esther J and Esther III are kind of like the TPI, you know, looks at the basic areas that TPI did. In fact, one study using TPI version two found that uh, the scores are pretty highly correlated. Uh, can't remember if it was the Esther J or Esther three they used, but one of those was fairly highly correlated with uh, the TPI three. So there are those kind of assessments, but these are also a lot less expensive than the TPI three, um, which, is, which is an advantage. So let's, let's go look at some of these. Uh, you buy them from esther.net. Each one costs about $2, either for the paper pencil version or the online version. If you buy the paper pencil ones, you gotta buy them. I think it's in a stack of 10, if I remember correctly. Uh, the online version, this is the Esther J. Remember, J is for students with mild disabilities. Uh, in the, this is the, the categories. And this is what the uh, scoring profile will look. It will also tell you the domains that it covers, employment, rec and leisure, home living, community participation, post-secondary education, number of items, and the number of yes items. So you can see this person was 100% in rec and leisure, 
13% in post-secondary ed, 38% employment, overall 47%. Esther J score continued, and it has one area, uh, strengths, I'm able to use the telephone, I practice healthcare by getting enough sleep, I'm a good citizen, and then possible areas con concern. And this is a unique aspect of the Esther J. It will give the, the item, like I need to develop an understanding of what to do in emergent situations and students X what they would like to do. They don't wanna address it, I'll work on this at home or other non-school environments. My parents would like this to be a part of my IEP. I would like this to become part of my IEP. Isn't that kind of cool what they did here? Because they don't have a version for students necessarily, but once the parent and educators have determined the strength of needs, students get to have their say in identifying if they want to include it in their IEP or not. The Esther J uh, strengths, I'm able, this is in the community participation. Uh, we have our strengths, areas of concern, Students get to indicate whether or not they want to be a part of that. So let's look at the Esther 3. This is an assessment for learners, learners with moderate to severe disabilities. Uh, the earlier version of it stated more disabilities. The, the newest printing of this, it's not a new edition, but it's just worded differently. It says with moderate to severe disabilities. And the domains are employment, rec and leisure, home living, community participation, and post-secondary living. This is kind of what the items look like. Um, employment, we circle zero, one, or two. Uh, this would be the teacher version. The I'm looking at number three right now. The learner demonstrates an awareness of time as it relates to events over the course of a day. And I is the educator would mark zero, one, or two. Two is the person who's really good at it. One, kind of so-so, zero, not at all. Number six, the learner demonstrates appropriate hygiene and grooming. One, two, zero, one, or two. Two's okay, one needs some help, zero, not at all. You know, these are broad steps. And if the student scores a, a zero, especially maybe a one, you might have to go into this a little more deep, deeply to find out exactly where the issues are at. The Esther 3, when you score it, this is the paper pencil version. Uh, you count up the total score for each column. You divide it by 272 to get your percent, your total performance score. A low score, as the paragraph states, a low score at the individual's exit from school indicates that support systems need to be in place. They don't tell you what a low score is. It's up to you to find out. Then Esther S, the, the one for students with uh, more severe or multiple, multiple issues. It looks at employment, rec leisure, home living, community participation, post-secondary ed. But then under employment, we have fine motor, grasping, pushing, attendance behavior, sitting with or without support. Very practical points. Uh, rec and leisure uses a switch to operate music, degree of interaction with others, can watch TV. Home living cooperates in hygiene tasks. What's the sleep pattern like? What about clothing selection? These are just a few of the items. Community participation. The extent the student participates in food ordering, grocery shopping, status of legal guardianship and status of post-secondary school housing is all within post-secondary education. In case somebody moves on into a, a post-secondary education experience, think college type program. So here's the, a section from employment to give you an example of what this looks like. We check all that apply. The learner demonstrates fine motor skill in grasping, pushing, sweeping, putting two objects together, stapping, stacking objects, pointing to objects, pressing buttons, drawing, opening, pouring, stirring. And we just check those that apply. 
with gross motor skills, sitting with supports, pushing to sit, rolling over, scooting a foot, walking, and use stairs. And the student is aware of season, years, month, date, and time. And if you do the online version, um, you don't get an overall score for this. What you get is a summary of what the answers were for each column, what the student does basically or, or doesn't do. Like Theodore does not demonstrate behavior that endangers himself. Theodore cares for personal toileting. Theodore cooperates in hygiene tasks. Doesn't ask if he, if he does it, but he cooperates in doing those. What do you think? Is that uh, something that you would be interested in? The Esther 3, Esther J, Esther S. Okay, now let's go forward and look at another assessment. In this particular assessment, a lot of educators like it. Um, it's downloadable, there's no cost, there's no data, psychometric data supporting it. It is truly an informal assessment. Um, we know the names of the people who developed this test. It's the Employability Life Skill Assessment. And it has some really unique features on it. I'd like to point those out to you. Look at the box in this uh, general direction page. Do you see 14, 15, 16, all the way up to 21? This is designed to be completed annually across the transition age years. That's pretty cool. So you can easily track progress, hopefully growth across time. And you can look back and see how someone did on this. They might be 19 now, and you can look easily to see how they did when they were 14. That I think is really pretty cool, is really pretty cool. And we score by using the following scale. Look under general directions where it's dark, that last sentence in general directions. We score using the following scale. Three, usually two, sometimes one, seldom, zero, never. So for each one of these, like under self-help skill in this example of the teacher or the demonstrates personal hygiene and grooming by meeting teacher's expectation for cleanliness, a two. So a two means sometimes. Meeting teacher's expectation for good grooming, hair comb, shirt tucked in, et cetera. One, which would be seldom. Got it? It's a very simple, and then you simply total these up. Uh, as you can see, this is a total of four, a total of six, and you'll see where those come in handy in a second. So we look at quality of work across these areas, you know, age 14 through 21, each item coming up with the total. Uh, and then, and this is the really cool part of this particular assessment, it gives you a graphic score. And this page goes on for up until 21. But say you started using this when the student was 14. It's, it's a bar graph or some people turn it into a line graph. I personally like the bar graph here. You just, um, you know, cut it. Well, I'm actually on second thought, I think the, uh, the line graph, this is the one where a line graph works best because you see the vertical line in the middle of each, of each column. You put a dot, say for home, for hygiene and grooming, the average, the, the total point total was a three. So you put the dot where it was a three, dresses appropriately was a five. And so we just take a line graph and we can see how the student did across all of these domains for age 14. The next year we do it for age 15 and we can create another line graph of progress. So it's one assessment that we can forward to the new teacher, or if you have students for a couple of years, you keep it and then forward it to the new teacher to keep track of how the student is learning things over time. But it's self-help skills, work habits, task-related work quantity, work quality, relations with supervisors, relations with peers, and work attitudes. But because we have self-help skills in here, it's, it's employability skills, but it also has some life skills with it as well. 
And it's one of the few general assessments like this for employability skills that to me has a lot of intuitive sense to it. And it's easy to use, easy to communicate to the IEP team what's going on. In a similar line, there's a life skill inventory. It has 15 domains, money, hygiene, safety. This would be akin to um, uh, what the TPI-3 or the um, uh, Esther-J, Esther-3 tries to do, I believe. It's a comparable one. Uh, I'd love to see the correlation results between the three of them, but it's scored in a very unique way. Uh, there's four levels of scoring, basic, intermediate, advanced, or exceptional. And they're all delivered by subdomain. And to go to the next domain, um, you have to know three of the five items to advance from basic to intermediate. And then you go from intermediate to advanced. So you have to score a high score on a certain number to go into the next category. So a per someone who knows the person well completes it. Usually it's a parent. Um, or the educator, if you know them well across all these domains, it's free. Just simply Google life skill inventory and there's a long web address where you can get it. This is what it looks like, housing. Uh, basic, must know two of two. Understands the concept of renting, knows how to access emergency shelter. So to be considered to go from basic to intermediate, you have to know at least basic. So you work on those until you understand intermediate. And here to go to advanced, you have to know three or four in intermediate. Uh, can read one ads for vacancies, understand basic terms, can calculate the cost associated with different types of housing, can describe pros and cons of choosing a roommate. So obviously these are for more higher functioning students, a big jump from looking at the Esther S but, but equally important, looking at post-secondary skills that are important to know. And if, uh, if students don't know this, this might be real useful for them once they get out of high school. Advanced have to know six of nine, um, can complete a rental application, uh, can identify the type of housing that is within budget. Um, understand the implication of the security deposit and who is a landlord and what is their role. I, I would love to see data to see how well these items actually fit within these categories. But we have interpersonal skills, legal issues of like look at basic, has the phone number of someone to call if arrested or victimized, understand generally what actions are against the law and what consequences are, um, knows rights if arrested, knows what the function of a lawyer is, knows legal age for buying alcohol and tobacco products, et cetera. An assessment that um, I really wish had supporting data because they did a really nice job with this assessment. It's the Casey Life Skills Assessment. It's web-based, you have to register to get free usage. It's available in Spanish, French, or English, and they have numerous supplemental assessments. Some of them are really cool, and there's one made in particular for students with an IEP that provides some really cool insight into what's going on. Uh, there's a youth and a caregiver. Caregiver would be a teacher, uh, somebody in a group home, a foster parent, whoever the caregiver is. The results are automatically scored and emailed to you. And if you go in and register as a, as a supervisor or the everybody feeds their results to you, you can get class summaries. And it provides different levels of questions based on students' ability levels which is really pretty cool, a lot in here. I do find it a little hard to manipulate their website to get to all the places you wanna go. Uh, they made some changes a couple of years ago, which to me 
made it more complicated to try to figure out how to get around. But it's all in here. You just have to go to this website, register, and just play with it to find everything. Uh, it's appropriate for youth ages 4 to 21, regardless of where they live at. It was originally designed for people in foster care, but so many special educators started using this because it was so easy, it was so snazzy. It had a, it had a youth form and an educator caregiver form of that um, now it's used across the country by a lot of special educators. There's 113 assessment items categorized in eight areas, skills, knowledge, and awareness. Uh, youth can complete one section at a time, stop and come back later, or they can do the whole assessment at once for 30, 40 minutes. That's why it's important to go in and register. So it saved it and you can go back and finish it. Uh, the constructs are permanency, daily living, self-care, relationship and communication, housing and money management, career, education, planning, looking forward. So it's a lot like TPI-3, it's like the ESTER, uh, it's like the, um, the life skill inventory, several areas. It's, this is kind of like the, the um, as my grandpa used to say, the Cadillac version of, of uh, adaptive behavior or living skill assessments. There's many supplemental assessments, uh, supplemental assessments for American Indians, homeless youth, younger youth. Uh, there's a, 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 an assessment for gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and questioning youth. There's one for students, there's one on educational supports. Uh, this is the one in particular for students with IEPs. It has just an excellent section for students with IEPs. And there's one for pregnant and parenting students. So go look at these. I mean, if you're, if this is something, excuse me, if this is one that you find appropriate for your students, do use it. It's an informal assessment. Students learn a lot taking it. Parents learn a lot taking it. And it um, gives you a lot of useful information. Too bad it's just an informal assessment. But on the upside, it's free. It's brought to us by the Casey Foundation. This is what the assessment looked like. I actually called them up one day a few years ago and asked them, do they have any supporting validity evidence? And they said, no, they made the, the, um, uh, they made the decision to put all of their funds into developing a really useful assessment tool that looks good, that is easy to use. And I believe, except for original navigation, I think they certainly achieved their goal. So as you can see, the seven parts are listed, the seven major components, and the one you're in is highlighted. Like this is housing and money management and uh, are the following statements like me? This is the student looking, this is the student version, obviously, excuse me. I understand how interest rate, rate works on loans or credit purchases. No, mostly, somewhat, mostly, yes. I know the importance of a good credit score. Uh, as you can tell, these are for students who are headed toward mostly independent living, of uh, maybe some semi-independent living, but, but students who don't need uh, a whole lot of support probably when they're out of school. Um, or they're, I don't quite know, by, by just looking at the complexity of the items, you can judge uh, the, the students that this is for. I can know how to balance my bank, my bank account. I put money into my savings account when I can, so forth. Uh, daily living. I know how to go and get on the internet. I can find what I need on the internet. I know how to use my email. I can create, save and print my, and send computer documents. Uh, we'll go down a bit. Uh, an adult I trust other than my worker uh, checks in on me regularly. And my worker, you can see that would be the caseworker. 
That's where kind of the language from being designed for foster care filters in. But I, there's an adult I trust other than my teacher. Um, that's kind of what that means for students who are not in foster care, but just in school. Checks in with me regularly. I can make meals with or without using a recipe. So I, I chose this example so you can see how the wording is. Uh, a lot of students will ask, who's my worker? What does that mean? And so now you know how to answer it. What areas are assessed? Daily living has 17 questions, self-care 17, relationships and communication about 18, all about the same number of questions. And you can see the competencies that are assessed across each, each of those areas. And housing, work safety, career education, looking forward, permanency. Permanency is a um, is an interesting concept. No other assessment that I know of has this. It looks at uh, a youth connections to trusted adults, uh, the community of support and overall independent connections. As young people need a strong safety net of support to learn the skills they need to move into young adulthood. That's a really nice addition to the Casey Life Skills. Uh, your score profile is like this. Uh, it will show you where the person is. It's not, it's kind of hard to interpret, I think, because it gives you by color code what it means. So uh, permanency is, uh, yes, is blue. So you can see this person was at maybe 30% for yes. If we add in yes and mostly yes, I would say that's at 40%. Somewhat is about 55. So yes to somewhat is about 55. So that means there's 45% that is mostly no or no. So that's how you would interpret the score profiles. And they will give you an overall statement uh, with yes, mostly yes, somewhat. So you can go through and you'll have to then manually pull out what the relevant strengths and needs are for what you're looking at. Maybe for needs, uh, you might be looking at not just the no's, but maybe somewhat, maybe with a little more focus and a little bit of instructional time, we can go from somewhat to yes. Maybe that's your focus. It's a need, but not as great. It's a relative need, not as great as the, as the no, perhaps. And you can see we have types of assessment. There's level one is elementary, level two is middle school, level three is high school, and we have educational supports is for, for all ages. And the number of items there is for 33. Um, what I've subsequently read is that uh, they, they've removed the, um, the levels the grade level by uh, elementary, middle school, high school, because they realize there's more and more students with disabilities who use this, that you can, can't just think of it as elementary, but look at it as your student skill level. Your students are at, the, at, a, at a growth in their skills such that they might be at level one, which would be comparable to what non-disabled kids would have at, at grades four and five. Think of it that way. So younger youth, uh, level one is 33 assessments. There's assessment two, which is middle school ages. Of, so this particular skill, KC life skill is a, it's, it's, a um, it's an awesome assessment to use. Lots of material if it's appropriate for your students. I, I have run across a couple of districts where everybody has to do Casey Life Skill Assessment, who's transition age and has an IEP. Well, it's not appropriate for everybody because not everyone, uh, do you want an, an assessment results back with all zeros on it or no tells you nothing. And so it wouldn't be appropriate for all students. 
it's appropriate for those students who it's appropriate for. For students who this isn't appropriate for, you have to use a different kind of assessment. Which brings us to the last two we're gonna talk about, the employment support indicators and its cousin, which we'll get to in a second. This is um, a really interesting assessment. This was developed by, uh, by, by Jan Moss primarily at the OU Health Science Center. Uh, and it's support indicators. It's, it's a unique, it looks at, well, let me back up for a second. When, when teachers do this, especially with parents, parents oftentimes get so tired of always hearing that when they do an assessment or when they hear the results of an assessment, the scores are all, you know, depressed. Like if, if the teachers had to do the Casey Life Skill Assessment on students with significant support needs, most of it would be no, the way those questions are worded, or mostly no. And that doesn't really help anybody out except to tell the student that the, what we already know, this student has a lot of room for skill development. And so this is a transition assessment that you can use that doesn't give you a score. And there's a positive answer in every situation. And it's a fresh of breath air for many students because they, this particular one looks at support indicators. What kind of support does someone need? And it's designed specifically for students with significant support needs. It's an informal assessment Someone who knows the student well has to complete this, or it's designed to be done in an interview format. So it would be a great way to meet a new uh, family. So a teacher uh, might meet with the family before school starts or right as school starts to complete this. And it's done designed to have an interview. It's, it's a structured interview with the educator and the parent or the educator or an older brother and sister or, or a younger brother and sister for that matter with somebody who knows the student well. It's an informal assessment. So it covers three domain areas, the employment preference indicator, social supports, work setting supports, work style supports. So here's an example of the social supports. Which statement best describe the social support, the social support needs? So let, let's look at how somebody understands affect or understands feelings. Um, so have, how well does Johnny understand facial expressions and gestures? Tell me some that he can understand. It's, it's meant to be kind of like a story starter um, as to, to guide a conversation. And then the educator would use this and just write beside the bullets kind of what the responses are. So it's a qualitative way of gathering support information that the student needs as they're thinking about um, perhaps a job. Uh, interpersonal skills, does the student understand personal space? Show me how. What, for instance, what? Uh, maintains appropriate voice value, uses accepted nonverbal cues appropriately, I think I'd add there too. Uh, handling criticism and so forth. Work setting support. Um, what environments are the best for the student? Brightly lit areas, dimly lit, natural versus artificial light or combination. What do you think? Tell me. What about noise levels or the size of work areas? Work style supports. What about initiation and sustaining work activity? The body clock function best in the morning, afternoon, or the evening. Isn't that pretty cool? So we just, you know, circle the item, make notes, and that's the assessment. And then you pull from that and you summarize the information uh, as strengths and perhaps needs. Uh, and you just say completed the work preference indicator on whatever the date was. And that's one of your transition assessments. We have the personal preference indicator, a guide for planning, which was the first one that was done. 
This one's available in English or Spanish. It's just like the work preference indicator. Uh, we're looking at the likes, dislikes, social indicators and choices of the person. It's free, it's available either at the Xero site or through the OU Health Sciences Center. Domain areas or favors, feelings, social word choices, body clock, health issues, family member roles. Um, so tell me, Mrs. Smith, what are Johnny's favorites? And how do you know that? How can you tell? Like, what are the person's favorite foods? How about friends? What are the person's friends? Uh, how about TV shows? What TV shows does Johnny like the best? What, what games does Johnny like the best? How, what kind of things do you do with them? How do you interact with them that he likes the best? What about animals? Music or sounds, smells, clothes? Uh, who, are the, who are the favorite people? Who are this person's favorite people? Why do you think that is? What are the person's favorite things about himself that he or she likes? Feelings, what calms a person? Does being held or, or, being, or holding someone calm the person, allowing the person to rock back and forth, smell odors, lights, laughter, animals? What makes a person happy and how do you know? and then wait for the person to, to respond. And then these are prompts to ask about what motivates the person. What's a person's best, best functioning time? So what I hope this webcast did is to give you an idea of the breadth of, uh, of independent living in, in, and employment skill assessments that are available. We can go from, from the, the norm-based assessments that are used for diagnostic purposes to more informal assessments that, uh, yeah, we still have to buy them, but they provide some useful information to a few that you can just download freely and use uh, at no charge that give some solid information, uh, but realize those don't have any supporting validity evidence to them. So you need to have another a tool in your transition assessment battery that does produce valid and reliable results. So on behalf of the Illinois Center for Transition and Work, my name is Jim Martin, and thank you for joining us on this webcast. Bye-bye.